But thank you for joining us to, to explore the fascinating world of the honeybee. References to the honeybee reverberate through our language. We find ourselves busy as a bee. When we have an issue that needs resolving, we might find a bee in our bonnet. And we might refer to somebody we admire as the bee's knees. Deeper investigation, however, reveals a reverence for bees spanning cultures and dating back to antiquity. From Roman Emperor Marcus Aurelius's appreciative musings to, of, on the toil of the honeybee, to 1968, 1960s heavyweight champion Muhammad Ali, expressing his desire to, quote, float like a butterfly and sting like a bee. These winged pollinators have been a constant inspiration for artists, politicians, and journeymen the world over. It is not their admirable work ethic, however, that has inspired millennia of devotion to the honeybee. They are the very engines upon which our global food supply runs. And their world is in flux. Tonight, Christy Hemingway, owner and founder of Gold Star Honeybees of Bath, Maine, and author of The Thinking Beekeeper, will detail her experiences in organic beekeeping and introduce Queen of the Sun, What Are the Bees Telling Us?, which examines the worldwide phenomenon of colony collapse disorder. Finally, we will convene in the museum's Art Science Gallery, which is adorned with scanning electron microscope images of the honeybee, and where Cambridge's own Follow the Honey will offer honey samples from all over the world. We hope you enjoyed tonight's program. Please join me in welcoming Christy Hemingway. Thank you, Tricia. Greetings. Like she said, I'm Christy Hemingway. And I usually say that any day in the world that I get to talk to people about honeybees is a great day. But in fact, I really want to thank you all for coming out here on a night this cold <laughs> to talk about bees, because it's not nice out there. And uh, I think you'll be glad you did, though, because I think you'll enjoy this documentary film that you're going to see, Queen of the Sun. So let me get my clicker, hit my timer. Click my timer. OK. Oh, that's not going to do it. Oh, well. If I go over 20 minutes, I'm sure someone will yell at me. Anyway, let's have a show of hands. Raise your hand if you are currently keeping bees. OK. And how about if you're thinking about becoming a beekeeper? Everybody, if you put your hand up once, keep it up. OK. And how many people out here are gardeners? OK, and how many of you are eaters? <laughs> right? OK, how many of us would like to eat nothing but safe, healthy, organic food? It's good to know we all have so much in common, isn't it? OK, so hands down. As you might know by now, I wrote a book about keeping bees in this newfangled, natural kind of beehive called a top bar hive. It's designed to support the natural, magical systems that you find at work inside a colony of bees. And I called that book The Thinking Beekeeper. Now, I thought long and hard about that title. And of course, I thought that it expressed exactly what I meant. But there's always room for somebody to take offense. And indeed, if you go out and peruse the reviews on Amazon.com right now, you'll find somebody who did. <laughs> he hasn't read the book. He was offended by the title. So I thought I would begin this evening by giving you just a little background on how I came to choose that title. This is the one time I actually get to read you some of my own book. How weird is that? OK. So welcome to the world according to Christy Hemingway. This book is a result of my first year as a backyard beekeeper with two conventional Langstroth square box hives containing sheets of wax foundation and why I made this weird switch over to top bar beekeeping. It is a how-to, why-to book. It's the amalgam of my own personal beekeeping experiences with the writings, the experience, the research, and the bee stories of many amazing people, beekeepers, farmers, gardeners, activists, researchers, scientists, authors, all these people that I've encountered since I had my first two hives. So this book does its best to ease the bewilderment that I remember feeling when I decided I wanted to start beekeeping. And then I discovered that if you ask 10 beekeepers a question, you are going to get 11 answers, possibly more. And most of them are going to be expressed pretty vehemently in no uncertain terms. 
but as a novice, you know, you're hoping for just one answer and you want it to be the right answer, only to discover that there's a hundred ways to keep bees. It gets confusing. So I try to make this research phase a little easier for you with the how-to parts of the book. But in the why-to parts of the book, I address the paradigm shift that I've seen gaining momentum since colony collapse disorder made its debut in 2006 and my subsequent founding of Gold Star Honeybees, which was in 2007. It's pretty clear that the crisis of colony collapse disorder in the beekeeping world is a symptom of wider problems in our environment and our food system and can't be remedied just by those of us who keep bees. As we became aware of the many connections between beekeeping, our broken food system, governmental corruption, and our own health and well-being, thinking people started to worry and to wonder, how did we get to this point? And how do we make the changes that we need to make to correct these problems? These are changes that are a matter of life and death to us and to our children. In the US, we've grown tired of expecting that the government will take charge and behave responsibly and do the right thing. But you know, we don't have to wait for the government to make the right move. We can make the needed changes in the government. Well, they can catch up. We can insist on organic food. We can shop at the farmer's market. We can choose never to put anything in a beehive but bees. All of these are viable options, and thinking people are doing them, and they are making a difference. So that's why I believe that the paradigm truly has begun to shift. In fact, I think we're close to the tipping point. And I also believe that we don't have to find a cure, some new treatment or pesticide or antibiotic for this thing called colony collapse disorder. We just have to quit causing it. So for those of you who get it, that honeybees are part of a huge, important, delicate, and complex natural system, and who think that you would like to do your own part for that system and for bees, this book is for you. In my mind, you will always be iconoclasts, rebels, renegades, in other words, thinking beekeepers. What you do matters. Never doubt it. <clears throat> so unless you've been living under a rock somewhere, you have probably heard that there's been some big deal brouhaha, some problem with honeybees for, let's say, six years now. But lots of people aren't really sure just what that problem was, whether we ever figured out what was causing it, or whether we ever solved the problem. So let's talk about that problem for just a few minutes. That bee problem got called CCD, or colony collapse disorder. And its primary symptom is this. Your thriving colony of bees, and that's about 65,000 honeybees, collapses, or it dwindles away over the course of a couple of weeks from 65,000 bees down to none. Now that's pretty weird, right? But it's even weirder when you know that when the colony collapses, they leave behind a hive just chock full of their young, which we call brood, and their food, which is of course honey. And that's really weird because the two things that bees will defend to their death by stinging, and you know that bees die when they sting you, right? Are their brood and their food. They don't just fly off and abandon these things. But with CCD, that's exactly what happens. And then another thing that makes CCD very strange is that all of those 65,000 bees just poof, they vanish. I mean, literally, they just disappear. There are no piles of dead bees to be found anywhere, which makes CCD pretty hard to study, of course, because there are no dead bodies. So that's pretty weird, too, huh? Who else thinks that's weird? That weird? <laughs> that's weird. You're right, that's weird. It's eerie, it's strange, and frankly, it's alarming. So scientists have been working pretty hard to understand this phenomenon since 2006, and what they've had to come to terms with is that colony collapse disorder is not a simple problem. There isn't just a one-to-one -one relationship between this problem and its cause, and that's a little hard for scientists to deal with because, hey, the best scientific experiments are all about having one problem, discovering one cause, and finding one solution. But it turns out that bees just don't work like that. In fact, scientists now will tell you that it's naive to think about bees that way because bees are connected to everything. So CCD is more likely being caused by a combination of many things. Many things. I heard one professor say that it, the number of combinations was infinite, 
and unknowable, which scared me. But lots of people have played a part in this story. There are some things that beekeepers have done. Early on, when we started keeping bees in square boxes, back in the middle 1800s, we started to use something called foundation in place of the natural beeswax comb that the bees make themselves. Foundation's purpose was to give the bees, quote, a head start in making their comb. So I'm going to send two things around for you to look at. And this first one is an example of a piece of foundation. And this particular piece is made out of plastic, but aside from that sort of hideous thought, what I really want you to notice is that there are a lot of little hexagons marked on this. Specifically, I want you to notice that they're all the same size. So I'm going to get Trish to launch this into the audience. Take a look at that and see what you think. <coughs> so the second thing that I'm going to show you is a piece of natural beeswax. Inside a top bar hive, this hangs like this. If you would handle it like this as it goes around the room, that would be nicer, and it will probably survive. It's fragile, but not that fragile. But the thing I really want you to know about this is that this is how bees do it without any artificial help at all. And that means that when you look at the sizes of the cells here, you're going to notice that they're very different. And what you're going to see is little cells that are girl bee cells and big cells that are boy big cells. Thanks. And if we just make sure that that somehow gets corralled at the end, that would be great. <clears throat> so when we started using foundation, it turns out we were actually changing the size of the hexagons in the beeswax honeycomb. And that meant that we were actually changing the size of the bee. And that meant that we were changing how long it took for them to be born, and that meant that it gets easier for parasites to get a foothold in the hive. So the law of unintended consequences played a big part in that one little idea of giving the bees a head start. So once we got these parasites, they're called varroa mites. To kill the mites, we started using chemicals inside beehives, strong chemicals, to which the mites developed a resistance and from which the bees seem to be getting sicker and weaker. Now, the thing about beeswax is this. It acts like a sponge. It absorbs all these chemicals that it comes into contact with. So now this very special place where the bees store their food and they raise their babies are all contaminated with things like organophosphates and synthetic pyrethroids and some other things that I can't spell or pronounce. And it turns out, though, that these chemicals survive being melted down. Like if you took a piece of comb and you melted it down and you had sent it away to somebody who makes it into new foundation. Now all the new foundation has those chemicals in it too, because they survived that whole process. So you can't buy clean foundation. It's all contaminated. So what we've managed to do is dirty up the very heart of the beehive. So that's what some beekeepers have done. And then there are some things that farmers have done, like growing food in gigantic monoculture farms. Almonds, for instance. Now, I bash the California almond groves a lot. But did you know that they're growing over 750,000 acres that are nothing but almonds? That's bigger than the state of Rhode Island. That's a lot of almonds. But here's the thing with doing that. First off, that kind of stuff is not normal. Nature does not do it. And it throws a lot of things out of balance, like bees. And here's how. Almonds only bloom for 22 days, just 22 days. So the other 343 days of the year, there is nothing in an almond grove for a bee to eat. So we started having to truck the bees, thousands of hives on the back of flatbed trailers, across the country to pollinate the almond groves. But of course, the bees can't stay there when the almonds are done blooming because there's nothing to eat. So now we have to truck them back out of there again. And we call this migratory pollination. And it's not just almonds. We pollinate lots of crops this way, apples, blueberries, pumpkins, cotton. This is pretty stressful for bees. And then there are some things that corporations have done. For instance, there's this new class of pesticides. You might have heard of this. They're not really new. They've actually been around since the 90s, but they're called systemic pesticides. Oops, sorry, wrong page. 
So that means that instead of spraying the pesticides on the outside of the plant, usually an airplane flying over a, uh, a field, we're now painting the poison directly on the seeds of the plant. That's what you're seeing there. S the systemic stuff being painted directly on the seed. So what that means is the pesticide as the plant grows is inside the system of the plant. And as the plant grows, the poison is in every part of the plant, the leaves, the flowers, the nectar, the pollen, all the parts that matter to the bees. So pretty bad news, huh? Are you depressed? <laughs> I'm depressed. But I don't want us all to be sad either, because I think that together, thoughtful, thinking people like you, like us, we can turn this thing around. So people ask me, well, what can we do? Here's some ideas. You can become an advocate for healthy organic food. And here in New England, that means you can join NOFA, the Northeast Organic Farming Association. If you're politically inclined, you can become an activist, against, especially against the use of systemic pesticides. You can become an educator. You can spread the word about the things that we can do that are better for bees and things not to do. You can become a gardener, growing healthy food for you and your family and for the bees. You can become an anti-roundup crusader. This is what we call this. Just as an aside about dandelions, dandelions are one of the very first things we see here in New Orleans when the growing season kicks back in and the bees are back out. Anybody that does anything bad to a dandelion is, is in my sights. I <laughs> just do not mess with the dandelions because it's really important that they have that nectar source early, early in the season. You can become a voter. This is Michael Pollan talking. I'm channeling him. He's one of my heroes, and he's all about voting with your fork, voting with your food dollar. Where you spend your money is just like applauding for a performance. And if you applaud for the yucky food with all the junk in it, well, you might encourage them to do an encore, and that is probably not what you meant. And of course, you can become a thinking beekeeper, and you would keep bees on natural wax without using any chemical treatments and supporting the natural systems that take place inside a beehive. So, I have no idea how I'm doing on time. Say again? OK, good. I'm right on it then. OK, so after the movie in the gallery with the bee pictures, the beautiful bee pictures, I'll be happy to answer questions and chat with you and sign your book if you like. Did you cut me off? Where did my pictures go? OK, well, let me just do this then. I invite you to sit back, relax, and watch this friendly and informative documentary, Queen of the Sun. There we go. I just wanted to show you some queen bees because isn't that kind of why we're here? Aren't they beautiful? Pretty girls? I'm proud of that picture. The main state apiarist, Tony Jadzak, took that picture. It got on the back cover of the book. And we should all remember this, because that connection is important. And so I'll see you guys after the movie. Thank you. The relationship of bees and flowers is one of the most beautiful co-evolutionary relationships we have. Bees are the legs of plants. Beekeepers, they are chosen by bees. You can brush by mustache. And they like. If bees left this world, I wouldn't like it because there would be no honey yep, and no fruit. Colony collapse disorder is the bill we are getting for all we have done to the bees. If we didn't have bees to pollinate our crops, we'd have to eat just, just bread and oatmeal, you know, all the time <laughs> and a couple of nuts. If bees are dying, birds will be dying, plants will be dying. We could call it colony collapse disorder of the human being, too. Steiner's prediction has come true. So many of the problems we face come down to one thing, and that is monoculture. 
The bees can't even live there. They'll starve to death. From the point of view of nature, it's, it's insane. And we've bred a race of super mites with every new chemical we throw at them. Pesticides came from warfare. And of course, they instantly kill the pollinators. When you see an airplane spraying, there's this tremendous feeling of not being able to do anything. I really don't want to lose them. I'm really finding out why I'm beekeeping is to keep that going for my children's children. <laughs> Our very lives depend on beekeeping. The bees sort of let me know, go ahead, we'll help you. Honeybee sanctuaries are springing up like mushrooms in this country. And they're coming closer. Only in the Bronx, baby. Where are you gonna find a swarm? You see the little antennae? It's lovely. Oh, look at this. Ripping with honey. People say that they can't keep bees. They're lying. Ladies and gentlemen, as you know, uh, we're going to be treated to a honey tasting next door in the Art Science Gallery. It's hosted by Harvard Square's Follow the Honey. Uh, this time, please welcome Kaneen Canning, who will tell us what's in store for us next door. Thanks. Hi. Hello. <laughs> Sorry, I don't really normally speak to this many people, but um, daily, uh, if not most days, I'm speaking to individuals like yourselves, um, local people who, and travelers, um, who are questioning uh, the honey that they have, and they also want to have delicious things, but have uh, love education at the same time. So what we get to do, which is so fun, and um, I guess a blessing to us all who work there is to um, have conversations with strangers and our friends alike about things like pollination and pesticide use and oh, I'm so nervous this is so strange <laughs> um, <laughs> but what's uh, my favorite quote of this film which we have uh, streaming uh, on this computer screen behind us constantly um, is uh, that bees are bi biologically dependent on community and I believe that um, of humans as well. And it's been lovely to see uh, the experiment that we've kind of started as a retail store to open up people's taste buds and then to also experiment with um, everyone from flavors of local variety of beekeepers who are literally four blocks down the street from where people had no idea there were bees um, to world honeys such as New Zealand. Um, we carry limes of Manuka honey and leatherwood. And so to be brief, I'm going to tell you a few of the ones that you're gonna be tasting tonight, which uh, there'll be six. And we'll start off in um, Hawaii. And there is a kiave nectar there, which is grown on the top of a volcano. Um, so this plant is grown out of volcanic ash and it's a completely white honey. It's uh, some of the purest things that I think many people have ever tasted, which is uh, the mildest, almost cold texture. Um, and then we'll have a local honey from Warm Colors Apiary. And then uh, there's three tables. I don't mean to make this complicated, but um, you're gonna start off with kind of light flavors. And in the middle, which I think is maybe one of my favorite tables, are two honeys from two amazing beekeepers uh, from this country, who are Kirk Webster and Dee Lesby. Um, Kirk, as you saw in the film, is a treatment-free beekeeper in Vermont. and. And Dee Lesby, we also source through Golden Rule, um, who is a, a wonderful um, organic, uh, they're, they're teachers, they're scientists, and they're local, and they source beautiful honeys. Um, Dee Lesby is a really wonderful beekeeper from Arizona, and much like you've seen um, in places like New Zealand, where you have amazingly pure nectar sources, um, you get honeys that are just, just 
I don't know, rare and beautiful and simple. And, um, and then lastly, you'll try two from Tasmania, which actually share, um, which I just learned <laughs> recently, um, 42 uh, degrees latitude, which uh, they share that, that the same peak, basically, uh, of the southernmost islands of New Zealand, which is where you have uh, an amazing abundance of biodiversity of landscapes, or you have uh, nectar such as leatherwood and tea tree, which is the manuka bush, which grow wild and uh, have no need for uh, Pesticides, and there are no uh, GMO crops uh, in the <laughs> down the street. So um, it's going to be interesting, and it, it's so beautiful to see Rosalind's photographs. We've been up there for about an hour staring at things. Um, <laughs> so thank you very much for having us, and we'll see you later. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. All right, folks, to kind of recap what we learned tonight, um, found out about monoculture being desert for bees, about how modern agricultural practices are destroying how nature is supposed to work, and that we have options here. Uh, we can vote with our forks, become advocates, activists, educators, defenders of dandelions, as Christy would have us be, and if you so do not desire, you can become a biodynamic beekeeper although you are not required to name your bees after the queens of England or use uh, the bees to um, brush your mustache um, or any such. Uh, uh, in all serious though, uh, we found out that bees have the power to bond families, communities, and nature, which leads back to Christie's chief point, that when one tugs at a single thing in nature, he finds it is connected to the rest of the world. <laughs>